more folks. We'll start at the end of this song. Hello, everyone. Good morning for me, but good afternoon um, for everyone else. And, and welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Um, welcome to NET's series, Inspiration on Demand, Creators in Conversation. I'm so happy to see folks here today. Um, I think most of you know me by now, but just in case, uh, my name is Patricia Garza, and I'm the Director of Programs and Engagement here at NET. Um, I'm a Latinx human with longish medium hair with purple cat eye glasses and I'm in my office with many books behind me and I'm wearing a blue blouse with kind of peacock pattern on it with these brown feathers and big brown earrings and that's for folks who need audio description. Um, I prefer to use they them pronouns but I also accept she her hers verbally um, and I just want to take a moment to uh, connect with the indigenous community on which my land that I sit, live and play on. And I live in Tongva Quiche land and zoom in from East Los Angeles, California. And if you'd like to participate in land acknowledgement today, I really encourage you to do so in the chat and we'll drop a link uh, in case you need that resource. So we'll, we'll put that in there. I also am just so delighted to acknowledge that beautiful music that greeted us into the space um, was created by NET member uh, Mina Malik, Malik, sorry, Mina, <laughs> Mina Malik, and her trio, Voki Angelica Trio. Um, the trio is an international band with members hailing from three continents. Straddling the genres of world folk and classical music, the trio creates an ambitious blend of cultures, reinvigorating traditional songs for contemporary audiences. I listened to the whole album and I'm obsessed. Um, huge thanks to the trio for partnering with NET and featuring their gorgeous work. We will be dropping a link to their website in the chat if you want to hear more, and you may just hear another uh, song later on in our series. Uh, so thanks to Mina and the whole trio for partnering with us. I want to take a moment as well to acknowledge my beautiful colleagues that are here with me supporting us today, Alicia Tonzik, NET's Executive Director, and Nicole Shiro, our Finance and Operations Manager. So if you have any access needs, just go ahead and put those in the chat and they'll help you out with those. Thank you, Alicia and Nicole. Um, just a short reminder, and I know so many of you have joined for so many of these, which I so appreciate, um, but what are we doing here in case you're new? Um, this series is uh, for NET's 25th birthday uh, anniversary, uh, and we wanted to create a space that really sparked inspiration uh, just when you need it, live, on demand, later. Um, we co-created this series with our amazing board members uh, in hopes that we can gift inspiration to all of those here live on the Zoom, but also on our YouTube channel with the recordings as well. So we posed this question to our board members. Uh, who are your mentors? Who are the artists you admire that really have informed and activated your own ensemble practice? So, so excited for today's conversation, but just to plug our June conversation is going to be with board member Alison de la Cruz uh, with legendary actress uh, Rose Portillo. So please tune in for the June conversation. We're about to nail down the date for that and we'll get that out to you. So now for the, the main party, the main event. Uh, I'm going to give a very a, extremely condensed uh, bio for these incredible guests today. Um, but just in case you're not familiar, I just wanted to give you a flavor. Uh, but you're going to get to know them very soon. So I'm just saying very bridge. I could go on and on. Um, so first, I just want to welcome Rosa Luisa Marquez. Rosa, so happy you're here with us. Uh, Rosa Luisa started her teaching career at the theater department of the University of Puerto Rico in 1978, uh, where she developed the curriculum of drama activities and teaches that in her workshops at schools, prisons, rehab centers, women's shelters, and community centers. Really interested in hearing more about that. 
um, numerous directing projects and published books, <laughs> including a few that just came out in 2020. Um, ongoing artistic collaborators ranging from Grupo um, Malo Yorba in Ecuador to Boel with Theater of the Press in Brazil, um, and so many more that I'm sure we'll get into today. Um, and we'll drop a link in the chat, Rosa Luisa, for your most recent publications, because I really want folks to be aware of what you've been up to. Uh, so we have, we have links to those books that we'll put in the chat. Um, a big thank you and welcome to Net Board member, Carlos Cruz of Carlos Alexis Cruz. Um, so Carlos is the producing artistic director of, and pronoun my, my French pronunciation, Carlos, you might have to correct me, uh, Nouveau Sud Circus Project, a circus for social change um, in service of intercultural and cross-cultural communication in the urban region of Charlotte, North Carolina. Carlos is also the Associate Professor of Physical Theater and the Diversity Coordinator for the College of the Arts and, um, and Architecture at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Wow, so excited to hear from both of you today. Um, so Carlos, I'll pass it to you to get us started. Cool, thanks, uh, thanks Patricia and, and welcome everybody. I am overjoyed um, just about many things. And I have a, a tiny script that I don't even think it, we're gonna go through. We might just ask questions and engage in conversation. It's so awesome to, first of all, to see so many colleagues here, Tony, you know, Jordan, everybody, Sabrina. But el, el mio amico Giulio Cesare Perrone. Hey, como esta, Giulio? Bene, um, bene. So, it's so so good to see you all. Um, so we're gonna just hop into this conversation in around 20, 1245, 12, 12, what is it, One forty-five. If I could get my times correct, uh, we will uh, stop and then allow you know for questions and answers, uh, uh, kind of uh, that kind of session here with all of us. Um, I'm just thrilled to when they ask me, uh, you know, who has inspired your career the most, or you know, um, it, it's a tricky question because we have run into many people in our careers that has influenced us one way or the other. But I, I, I there is many things in my life that wouldn't have happened without Rosa. You know, I quite frankly wouldn't be doing theater probably without Rosa. I was a little disenchanted with, uh, you know, or not uh, necessarily as excited with theater, with the classical or commercial theater. And I had to look for something that spoke uh, stronger to me and, and, and the experimental theater uh, sort of wing within the, the Department of Theater at the University of Puerto Rico really spoke to me at that time. So among the things, there's that. I started teaching at a prison as part of one course with her, and I did that for three semesters, and like that influenced quite a bit of the way that I approach education and the work, the way that I approach doing the work. And I met my wife in class, in a class with Rosa. So the journey goes <laughs> in all ways possible. So it, to to say that Rosa has been influential in my life is 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 just a severe understatement. I think it's been quite central, and and I'm just pleased and excited and overjoyed to just have you here. So bienvenida Rosa, um, at, at este círculo no, at the circle of the network of ensemble theaters, and um, and you, I think you, the wisdom the wisdom that you have imparted in us at the University of Puerto Rico and beyond. Um, I think there's a lot to be said and learn, uh, you know, f as we look into take down all borders and all walls and keep looking south from this uh, country where the history and heritage of theater is so rich. Um, and, and not even talking about what the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico is and the complexity that that is. So there is so many things to kind of like <laughs> tackle and hit and talk about. So we'll see where we go in this conversation. So um, I don't know if you want to say anything at the top, Rosa. No, um, I'm just going <laughs> to link to what you're saying. And I was telling Patricia that I'm going to need help. I haven't been speaking English for a long time. As you know, Puerto Rico is a Spanish speaking island. So I get uh, very few chances to interact in, in English. So whenever I lose a word, I would like you to help me with it. Um, yeah. And Alexis speaks about mentors. And right now, I think that we are all grandchildren of somebody. And um, I am also preparing at this point a tribute to one of my mentors. Her name is Mirna Casas. And she was my professor at the university. And she did more or less, except for find, finding me a mate 
<laughs> what I did for you. Uh, in a sense, it is opening windows or opening doors or sharing our obsessions with the next generation. And it is now, uh, it, it's going on reverse. Now we, it's our time to pay tribute to the elders and also to connect with the younger ones and find out what they're doing. And I think what you're doing is also multiplying this experience that marked you, but it also marked me. And I think we are all product of our cir circumstances because if I hadn't been at the university in 1967, more or less, uh, I wouldn't be the theater person I am now. So it's the same thing that you describe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, ditto to all that. And I'll say, you know, I agree. If we go in Spanglish, forgive us all. That's part of, that's what happens. <laughs> um, we will do our best. So let's just get right on. I mean, I have like two main questions. And I think with this one, we just will go into some historical aspects. But for me, the first one that I started was why theater? You know, why, you know, why teatro? Por qué hacemos teatro? Um, it, and, and what in theater in Latin America, you know, has a, its own journey and a strong history from different angles. So what is it that is speaking to people and why do you do it? Why do we do it? I would say that when I was a child, um, the first theatrical experience had a lot to do with church going because the church and here mostly it's Catholic, it, it's a a whole theatrical environment, whatever we go through in the ritual of the mass, uh, it's something that is ingrained, ingrained in our spirit. We, the ritual of the mass affects all our senses, but if we go into any kind of ritual, we go through that same process. So it affects our sense of smell because there's incense, people sing, people gather together, they have a main objective. Uh, people um, are um, together in, in connection with something that is beyond earth. And I think that is uh, a nature of theater that is very, it has a spiritual quality. Although I am a non-believer now, all those elements that form me as a, a, a Christian person uh, are in my version as a theater person. And when I was around 10, I had two major experiences in theater that marked me. When I was around 10, I was invited to participate in one of those uh, pastorelas, uh, Christmas, um, pageants and I was really moved by um, receiving applause. That was a very personal and a very uh, egocentric uh, feeling, but I felt like in that space, there was a community that accepted me, but not only accepted me, that cheered me, that gave me their response through applause. And at the same time, my father, who was a very rigorous theater critic in Puerto Rico, although I didn't live with him, I lived with my mother, who was the one that raised me and made me what I became, uh, he gave me flowers. And between the flowers and the applause, I felt like I was in the space I should be. This was one. The other one was more threatening. I was in the theater at the University of Puerto Rico, which is a major theater venue. It has 1,800 seats. And I was watching a play and I didn't know the difference between life and fiction. So I was watching this happening behind the fourth wall. And I wondered if at the end, these people were real. And it, I, I felt like um, I was gonna be, uh, very afraid if they traveled through the threshold and came to us because I thought that they lived inside that bubble. So at the very end of the play, when people applauded, they came down to greet the audience. And it was one of the most scariest experiences of my life because 
my fears became true. It was like theater was something of a dream or a nightmare together. But it had a fascination and that attracted me to it. When I went into the university, um, I, I wanted to, because theater was not an option in the sense of economics. I, everybody told me there's no way you can survive in theater. Uh, so I started studying psychology. And when I went to the exams, they were objective exams. It was yes or no, or choose the best answer. And I didn't believe that I belong in a place where everything was so um, specifically uh, uh, chartered. And I went by the theater and they were playing a, um, a production of Divine Words by Ramon del Valle Inclán, Divinas Palabras, a major production. And I saw what was happening there and <laughs> they, they breached the fourth wall, they entered the audience. I was not scared anymore. And I said, this is what I want to do. So from then on, I'm talking to you about in my junior year, I decided that theater was my option and I continue it till now. I haven't stopped. And I found a way through education uh, because my options are not professional theater in the sense of economics, that I could um, channel all my theatrical activities through the university in, where I did practically what I wanted to do, which was a place of freedom. Well, so many things. Uh, sometimes we forget <laughs> precisely the sense of, uh, you know, or the space of disbelief or what people believe when they see a theatrical production. I, I remember doing my, what that first movie I did for Telemundo, Bala Perdida, you don't know if you remember. And people talking to me in the streets, oh, you're not that bad. And I was like, I was a character, people like in that movie. What is good, I guess, you know. Um, there is that. And, and the other thing that I want to sort of rescue and lift up is the aspect that, you know, theater is community and theater is ritual and is rooted in that, but is very connected to us in the many rituals that culturally have made who we are, that have been sort of imposed, but also have been uh, that we come from that as well. Um, you know, and the pastorela is very present. I didn't know that side of you, that <laughs> you were in pastorelas. That's a thing that I, in, in Teatro Milagro in Oregon, I, I got to tackle a little bit and work with. Um, so then let's go into something that is very connected to this conversation and the people of this association, which is ensemble making, ensemble theater. In Latin America, we call that Teatro Colectivo uh, or collective making theater. And then, then my question is why Teatro Colectivo? Como, how do you get there? Um, and then, you know, if you can go a little bit deeper in the journey that you have had from Boal to the work with Yuyashkani and Malayerba and so on, and where is those connections and those foundations probably make sense to us here in the United States? Yeah. Well, I go back and forth between intuition and, and studying, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, when I started doing theater at the university, uh, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War era. So there was a sense of uh, impending doom and death because there was uh, what they called um, selective service that was uh, compulsory. From the 69 to 73, our men were uh, obliged to join the, the army. And most of them from Puerto Rico went to Vietnam and many came back either hooked on drugs or hurt or killed. So it was a life and death situation. And I find that the best theater is produced, the poetry of theater, is best produced in situations such as these. And I think at this moment, we should be studying what kind of theater we're gonna be producing because we are living in a very, a very uh, difficult life and death situation. The AIDS project, for instance, comes out of that situation. So at that point, we had this possibility that many of our colleagues and students were gonna be dying in Vietnam. And we were questioning all sorts of authority. So instead of trying to go into the main stage, we started producing things that had to do 
with the hallways, with the squares, with uh, open spaces. I had visited uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music in 1968 with this teacher who's my mentor, uh, Mirna Casas, and I saw uh, Paradise now. And I felt that that play changed all the relations that I had seen in theater, all the hierarchy, all the character owning of, of the, the actor owning a character, all the possibilities of the theater games that could happen there with the audience, audience engagement. And I think that piece marked the beginning of my proposals at the university as a student director. And so we started working in communities and doing theater at the university. I remember using the play, The Leader by Ionesco in order to make fun of our uh, chancellor at the university then, because everybody was claiming for the leader, here comes the leader, uh, we should, uh, and the leader was like a messiah. And at the end, when the messiah came, the messiah had no head. And we had this chancellor that, that people presented as a character, as a messiah. And this chancellor who was good for many things, but was also very repressive, uh, we made fun of him. And I remember using masks, but the masks were paper bags over our heads, not for theatrical purposes, but they served. It was because we didn't want to be identified because if we were identified, we would be expelled from the university. So that was the climate of working collectively and having a very horizontal relationship between the members of the group. Once in a while, we would bring a very good mentor to work with us and direct us. He, uh, Victoria Espinosa directed us in Stories to be Told by Osvaldo Dragun, which was also uh, an independent theater piece coming out of Argentina that was done on the streets and also done on theaters. So we found also, we were visited by Enrique Buenaventura. Enrique Buenaventura is the uh, pioneer of collective theater in Colombia, El Teatro Experimental de Cali. He's the first uh, conceptualizer of that project. And he de develops a method of collective creation that is a text. You can read it as a theory. But in Colombia, there was also another man in Bogota uh, Santiago Garcia. And Santiago Garcia developed a whole project of collective creation that was very horizontal, in which people work, <laughs> they work for about training in the morning and rehearsing in the afternoons. Each piece took around two years to ensemble. And it was because they all had participation. This was a group of around 20 people. And each one of them had to research the theme, bring in materials, improvise, and then the whole collective would decide what of that improvisation remained and what was left for something else. So those, uh, that movement was very strong, but that movement was also enhanced by El Teatro Campesino in the United States, Bread and Puppet Theater in the United States, uh, San Francisco Mime Troupe. And I had studied my master's at NYU at the time where the university was closed because of uh, uh, moratoriums and, and student unrest. The students had sequestered the computer and the computer was not something like this. It was a huge, huge uh, structure. And if they had done something with a, that computer, the, I would say that the whole university system would have collapsed. So the university closed. It closed in March or April of 1970. And we were uh, told to practice what we had learned on the streets in activities that had to do with peace. And I had seen Schechner presenting environmental theater and that also changed the scheme of the 
possibilities of creating a play in which everything happens around you, in which an object transforms into many, many possibilities, very polysemic, no? So I was really stimulated by all of that. And then I came in contact with Boal. In 1974, he published Theater of the Oppressed, which is a very important theoretical book in which he picks up the theory of Aristotle, then he challenges it with Brecht's theater, because Aristotle wanted you to empathize with the main character, whereas Brecht wants you to put that character at a distance and you as an audience member to criticize it and think other options for that character. And finally, Boal proposes not only that you think differently to the main character, but that you enter physically the stage to change the conditions of the proposal. And that also brought me other ways to deal with the theatrical experience. With that, I can add that I was doing my PhD at Michigan State University, and there I learned more about creative drama. And creative drama is theater play. It is the participation of the audience as an actor, as a, a figure of change through the arts, through poetry. And that combined with the theater games that Boal proposed created the possibility of that course that is Brincos y Saltos or Leaps and Bounds in which the student is a creator in the classroom. <clears throat> so the classroom provides me an equivalent, an analogy to the collective creation process that these people in Latin America are using as a means of expression, as a means of investigation, and as a means of transformation of the participants and the audience. Well, um, it, it's, it's, it's a journey for me between the memories of being in the classroom, doing that exercise with the chair that, about like what the chair is not just a chair, would you sit down, where does it transform and mean something else? Uh, obviously, obviously in Brincos y Saltos is where I met my wife. So, you know, also knowing that and what that course has meant and they, they, how I use um, all those elements still in my own teaching here. Uh, so, yeah, so there's a lot. Um, I just want to go back to something that is something that I sort of mourn this day because uh, the university in Puerto Rico has been a point of rebellion and a point of like resistance uh, for the longest time. And obviously, politics are changing this day and age and there's so many things happening we're sort of losing that angle in which the academic environment where there's academic freedom and there is a free of thought and whatnot that has been um just it seems like by the minute it's been held back in one, in a place in where actually uh, other forces are dictating what we should be saying and doing and um i, I think it's a it, this this conversation is a is a solid reminder that the the idea of being educated is to help each other understand what's happening and to resist forces of what uh, politics and government and people and power and so on are trying to guide us to do. What is it that we can do? In which way we can use the arts to communicate to the larger population that what is happening is doesn't have to be necessarily accepted, and that we need to find our own voice within. So, um, so I wanted just to take that shirt and lift that up, and at the same time say like, how do we constantly are back educating and producing you know studying and producing and producing and studying because a, a lot of the time we get we, we give a, uh we, we we became complacent that we are doing the work and that's the way that we do the work and we're ignoring that actually things are evolving and the population is evolving and our audiences are evolving and they want to hear and, and and see other things and we should continue to study what else needs to be happening to and continue to understand all of us and where we are at in these situations as we produce further work. Um, it seemed like you were gonna say something on top of that. Yeah. I that you have, uh, has una cascarita. you have thrown a peel, a banana peel to me so that I can slide in it and continue talking. It is the University of Puerto Rico, which is an institution that started in 1903. 
and that created a middle class for the country, which we didn't have before. And right now it is in danger. We have two dangers, the pandemic, which has stopped uh, any movement at the university, but also we have a fiscal junta, fiscal uh, overseer, economic overseer, because the country is in tremendous debt. And now the junta has decided that by cutting the budget of the university, and they have cut it by more than half in two years, that's the way that the uh, bonistas, ¿cómo se llaman los bonistas? Uh, the the shareholders yeah. uh, can, can receive the money that they are due because we have had very corrupt governments that have uh, uh, rented <laughs> or sold the country. But what I'm trying to say is that a middle class, which I belong to, which you belong, Carlos, uh, was possible, possible because of a public university. When I studied at the university, tuition was $12 a credit. When I left the university, tuition was $70 a credit. Still very low compared to any university in the United States. And uh, we were paid this decently when I left the university. And now there are no possibilities of tenure track positions. There are no possibilities of adding new courses. We had a university with 60,000 students in a country of 3.5 million people. Now that has been reduced by half. And now the pandemic has forced a new relationship with the physicality. And, and that goes to the essence of theater and that goes to the essence of the university. If we cannot meet, we cannot conspire. If we cannot meet, we cannot create together a new and better world. And that is what we're facing when, when they open, maybe in August, we yet don't know. We have to create a new space And in theater, we have to create a new space in which we can say what we want to say, because the pandemic has uh, eliminated the possibility of the embrace and the exchange of physical energy. And the university closing also does the same. And so there's no questioning, there's no transformation, there is no... Uh, imagination possible in a space that is practically closed. So you gave me the banana peel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is, and, and the banana peel is there for sure. I mean, that's something that in my own university here, I, I am advocating for and to change the art squad. There's no place of gathering outside of the classrooms. And if there's no place of gathering because of the sun, because it's, there's no seats, uh, then you're not allowing the people to be with each other, to conspire, to change, to apply knowledge, to, to use the, like, the generation of new knowledge into further things for the population of the city and beyond. Yeah, and, sure. yeah, and I, I have actually mentioned our Glorietas in, at the University of Puerto Rico, these open large gazebo spaces that students tend to gravitate in between classes. And that's where a lot of rehearsal happened with music, with protests, where all of those things happen and gather in those open spaces within the campus. And yeah, I am, I, I, I feel that and I've been feeling that from the distance, from the diaspora now for sure. And, uh, and it, it is painful to see it. So, so yeah. So going, going, there's so many things. Oh, and we have like five, <laughs> five minutes before the Q and A. That's great. Uh, I there's so much. I mucha tela de donde cortar. I keep saying this. I think I see they say this in our pre meeting. There is so much fabric to in which we can cut and make a lot of dresses or costumes or whatever we're making. Um, but uh, one thing that I really wanted to touch base with and connect is like like for me was very important in my upbringing. The a talk the Escuela Internacional de Teatro de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. It was a way in which different uh, companies from around Latin America connected through artistic conversation and education as a way to actually uh, bring a unified voice for these issues that are plaguing all Latin America. 
And I think that's a great example of the power of how this kind of theater uh, can do to uh, to change policy, to change uh, politics in a way. Uh, so if you can just like shine a little bit of light in that direction, it'd be great. Yeah, the Italic was a, a theater school that was really imagined by many theater practitioners based on workshops and based on the idea that since we are so far apart and many of the countries don't know what is happening in the other country. Uh, and in the case of Puerto Rico, we are an island, isolated island. Uh, to find a way, a structure that could uh, twice a year hold workshops in different countries with major teachers or major groups. We would go uh, or bring in the teacher to the, the seed, at that time, and the teacher would have a, a hundred students and they would engage in about 10 days, two weeks, perhaps a month of exchanges in theater. And then the idea would be that each person that was there would take the materials learned and in turn uh, adapt them and adopt them uh, at their country of origin. So during, so 16 years, there, there were 36 such workshops. The director of the school was a very inspiring man. He's the one that I mentioned who wrote Stories to be Told, Osvaldo Dragón from Argentina. And uh, it was an itinerant school, and it was a school that was not under any government. Whoever was going to be the producer of the event had to find the funding for the event. And whoever wanted to go had to find the funds to go there. Uh, it, it was very meaningful. And I would say that a trace of that has remained in groups such as Grupo Yuyashkani from Peru that holds an international workshop every year in August. And this year they're gonna do their workshop through Zoom. And um, Malayerba in Ecuador who throughout um, maybe 15, 16 years, continue doing their workshops. Um, so it is, and in Brazil, there are groups still doing the same modality. And I think it's a modality that can be duplicated and can produce uh, effects that are reverb throughout Latin America, the US, and even Europe. We went to the Oden Theater at, at um, uh, Dinamarca. Austin, and held one workshop there. Mm -hmm. I lost you. What, what happened? No. Oh, I lost here. you. <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here. Um, yeah, I mean, and, 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 and what it did for, for us in Puerto Rico, and we haven't even tackled, like, talk about that. We are in a cultural limbo. I mean, over there, I often say we are not Americans, but in Latin America, we often do, are seen as these American citizens. Um, we live in this island. It's a tiny island in which we o sometimes only look inward and and uh, not necessarily stretch or look uh, to, to what's happening, even like in places as close as South America and Central America and so on. So when I went with you to uh, Ecuador to work with Malayerba, uh, it opened the whole realm of, of, of not only like the, the indigenous aspect that exists within our cultures that are within theater, because we have that issue about the indigenous in Puerto Rico and how history has started to erase that. Um, or the history that they try to teach us, right? Um, the popular aspect in Yuyashkani, for example, what elements of popular culture co communicate and talk directly to the communities and so on. Um, it's just, uh, it opened doors on, in ways that theater is not just one angle, but that there are a lot of histories and that those histories should be honored and, um, and should be explored. I mean, so, so yeah, so many, many, many more things. I could, I have many more questions, but I, I think I'm gonna stop here uh, and then uh, see if anybody in the, in the what is that people call this the gallery, the Zoom room, this space, has any questions for us. And I don't know, Patricia, if you've seen like any questions yeah. in the chat. Um, I think some folks had a little bit more questions about, and I might be mispronouncing this, the I, I them, the international school. Mm -hmm. Maybe just maybe just briefly kind of go over what that was again. Um, 
I couldn't find a link to put in the chat, but, um, and then if folks have other additional questions, you could either put them in the chat or just let me know and you can, you can come on camera or just speak them into the space, but maybe we could start there. Okay, this was a school that started in 1989. In um, the, the, this group of people had met in Cuba because of all the countries in Latin America, the only country that recognizes Puerto Rico as an independent cultural and political country is Cuba. And uh, we had a meeting there and uh, it was decided that we needed a school like the film school that they have there that was sponsored by Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez, the a Nobel Prize winner from Colombia. But theater has a different character than film. Film is an industry. It, it is an international, a global industry. I think theater, the best it is, it's when it's local, when it's immediate, when it deals with issues that have to do with our immediate audience. And that's why your conversation about the original cultures is very important because we have a tradition. And, and I learned that after I was at the university, I was not taught this. I learned it through my skin and through the popular actions in, in my community. But at the same time, I read the chronicles from the Spaniards that came here in 1493 and they described the traditions of the indigenous people. And those traditions we keep on repeating. So the structure of this school was a very uh, open school uh, and we would travel to different countries. And, and the issue with theater is that it is not, a, it is not the same through the media. Theater has to be live. And uh, that is a problem because I cannot see live theater from Nigeria if I don't go to Nigeria. And that uh, brings in a, a problem, a problem of economics, no? And uh, so we, we had that problem as, a, as an isolated island that we see very little theater unless it comes here or we go out. So we started going out to these different Latin American countries. We also went to the States to work with Bread and Puppet. And as I said, to Italy, to Milan and to Denmark to work with uh, uh, Noruega, no? Noruega, uh, Norway, to work with uh, uh, the Odin Theater. And uh, that lasted until I think 2005. And it hasn't, it hasn't continued. It is up to those thousands of students that went to the school to create a parallel project that could have the spirit of the school, but it could have new and different characteristics. So I, I give it back to you, Patricia. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, I think that's really inspiring. It's this ripple effect that we wanted to see kind of sustained over time. I love that. And so um, we we are all inheritors of that. So Carlos Alexi multiplies that. And all of those that went to the school are multiplying it in their own way. Yeah. You know, there is a, I just want to, maybe, maybe that's something to, to, to explore. You know, like we serve here in this country, people that come from many backgrounds and many communities. And, um, the, to have that level of an international school connecting to the roots of most of some people or all people in this country in a way there's something about that that will like speak very directly uh, it's because it comes from the uh, your own culture uh so so yeah uh, it, there's there's a lot of where my head is going with this <laughs> well i would love to just make space if folks want to join uh and ask their question live we would definitely welcome that you don't have to come on camera you could just unmute and and speak it into the space or if you want to put it into the chat just trying to look and see it takes time <laughs> to break the ice <laughs> I also would love to hear, oh, Elisa, hello, darling. Hola, ¿cómo está? Rosa Luisa, mi nombre es Elisa Bocanegra, mi familia de Aguadilla. Um, I was uh, born and raised in the States. I was one of my few siblings who was, if the rest of them were born in Puerto Rico, but in my house, we were not allowed to speak English. 
because my mother was like, we're preserving the culture. So that's it. Um, pero te voy a hablar en inglés porque estamos aquí. You know what I mean? We want to be inclusive here. Um, my, I, I would love to start a children's theater in Aguadilla, where my family is. Mostly because um, a lot of uh, that passion came for me after the hurricane, when it took so long to rebuild the parks. The children didn't have much. But what do you suggest for someone like me who, like my board president lives in San Juan. I have many company members who live there. My theater company is in Los Angeles. Um, but we're planning on starting something in Puerto Rico. But I kept saying, I want to start a children's theater. And everyone looked at me like, what? And I said, in Aguadilla. Uh-huh. I would say- For, someone, for me, someone like me who wants to do that, what do you say, who do you suggest I speak to about um, other children theaters, perhaps in Puerto Rico, or I would love to, to get some of your guidance with the roadmap, you, you know, with that. I'll give you my email. I'll write to you because it could be a long list. There are people here uh, still, even through the pandemic, doing theater. One of the I'm... groups is called Asirk. Asirk, although it's in San Juan, he, they do touring. And uh, what they're doing, they have a space in old San Juan, which was an, an old building turned into a multicultural center. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing, kids and adults alike, is uh, circus techniques. So they, they teach theater games, they teach the cloth, they teach the hula hoop, and they teach ballet, and they teach many other things. So there is a structure here that can be a home to, at the beginning, when you start speaking to them. There's another person in San Germán, which is close to Aguadilla, whose name is Aravin Ajantaya, and he has a cultural center in San Germán. Um, there, there are groups like Inuavia Luz, who, that, that is of the same generation as Carlos Alexis and have dedicated themselves to theater of objects, stilts, um, drawings, cardboard, inspired in the techniques of Bread and Puppet. Because in the States, Bread and Puppet is one of the companies. Peter Schumann, the director is 86, but is, he's as young as 15. And he still trains people to do theater wherever with all the objects turned in, into poetry. So they can draw clouds and you have cardboard clouds that uh, meet the real clouds that are in the sky. <laughs> uh, so so th I think that um, I the book of, of theater games that Carlos Alexis used in the class of leaps and bounds, brincos y saltos, it could be of use if you want to, it's, it's available. You can, you can use it as a reference. Maybe dealing with the public school system and seeing if there is an after school program that you can go mm -hmm. in. See, and, and, and just go by the community. I, I can give you some names that might help you. Thank you. Gracias. De nada. <laughs> love it. Love the connection. <laughs> Thank you, Elisa. Um, I think Jerry. I know. I think Rosa Luisa, You may have answered this, but I would love maybe even an expansion of, you know, if somebody was visiting, uh, to really explore the theatrical landscape there. You know, what would we have to experience to kind of understand that kind of cultural landscape? See, sí, uh, I, I was going to say it's a good question because like in many places, obviously there's commercial and there is uh, all kind of other endeavors uh, happening. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm equally curious too. <laughs> I would say that at this point, uh, in, the, in the middle or hopefully at the end of the pandemic, there is a very interesting group that has worked mostly through uh, virtual means is called Teatro Público. Teatro Público is directed by some uh, cultural acti activists from the island, but also from a student, uh, an MA student at Julia, her name is Gabi Sacker, Sacker with a K. And they were opening uh, a, an independent theater piece of uh, The Seagull, 
two years ago, they were opening and the pandemic stroke. So since, uh, if you define theater as architecture, and if you define theater as a script, all those venues are closed. If you define theater as an experience, people are doing theater. And they're doing also options through the media. Uh, the, uh, Teatro Público has dedicated itself during the last two years, and you can go into the uh, portal, into the page, um, to uh, provide workshops, provide, now they're doing readings. They started with a reading of Waiting for Godot, and now they did something by Maria Elena uh, Fornes, uh, Maria Irene Fornes, uh, Fefu and her friends. And they're doing, uh, I think every two weeks, a reading of a play. So you gather in front of your computer and you hear theater read by people that are good readers. So they're finding different options to connect people through theater, waiting, waiting in the starting line for the pandemic to open up because I think you have more flexibility in the States than we have here. But what is interesting is that the pandemic has closed the architecture that we call theater whereas it hasn't closed the experience that we call theater. Because the architecture that we call theater, so the theater building, is closed because when you go in there, the costs are so high. And in order to pay the actors, pay the technicians, you have to get 100% a, of the ticket sales. And now they're only allowing from 30 to 50% of occupancy. So that challenges the possibility of doing theater, which I think is happening in Broadway, no? But theater is more than that. For me, the essence of theater is what happens between actors and audience, regardless of the space you're doing it in. And that's why I can't wait. And we're trying to do this piece for my mentor, Mirna Casas, in the main stage at the University of Puerto Rico with what you call social distancing, or physical distancing and, uh, and return to that spirit that is essential for us. And I think we touched on this, Tony, but Tony asked in the chat, just a question around this kind of, what you're talking about this tension around economics and theater tickets. And I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but maybe just, just to touch on this, this idea of theater, best theater is local as an idea and the idea of sustainability practice when the local culture and economy doesn't evidence strong interest in theater. So how to follow that idea of local um, locality without economic infrastructure of cultural momentum? Maybe touch a little bit about that. I mean, you kind of already did, but I don't know if you have anything to add. I am understanding you well. I think that what happens is that we have to change our point of view if we start seeing our everyday actions as, as theatrical actions, if we start seeing our everyday rituals as theatrical rituals, you're gonna see that more people are connected to theater than we ever thought. If theater is a ritual where you have to get dressed, pay a ticket, which is really most of the time quite expensive. So you're gonna see theater once in a while. Uh, you're gonna opt to do something else instead of seeing theater. So if we go back to the essential reason of theater, which is a celebration between the community in order to either honor somebody or mourn somebody or party with somebody, if we see our costumes in those parties, if we are, see our traditional ritual costumes, our masks, I have a mask here, which is part of the tradition of theater in Puerto Rico, but we usually do not connect that with independent theater. We see those things, this is folklore, the other is intellectual and good theater. If we start mixing those elements, if we 
understand that we are a mixture of those influences and start connecting to the essence of that community that we belong to, that community will be there with us. It will be with, there with us in church. It would be there with us in sports. It will be there wherever, in school, wherever we meet and gather. Each gathering has to be a theatrical gathering. Wow, I love, I love it so much. <laughs> Thank you for that rousing, I think, perfect place to kind of button up our conversation today. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, Carlos, Rosa Luisa, I cannot thank you enough. How, what an inspiring, just way for, to start my day and to end some folks afternoon. Wow, thank you. Theater is everywhere. I love that. I love that. Take care. Thank you. There's so much love for you all in the chat as well. So thank you all for being here. Just a quick reminder, you know, that uh, if you're not a member of NET, we would love to have you. We have pay what you can membership until the end of June. Please join. Um, please join us on our social media. We'll put this recording up so you can engage with it again. I think everybody needs to hear that last speech again. <laughs> including our Instagram is really popping right now. We have some great stuff happening over there. Um, just thank you both so much. And Rosa just put her uh, email in the chat for, for Lisa and whoever else wants to contact her. So Carlos, just, last words. <laughs> just, uh, Rosa, un abrazo, un beso. Like, tú has sido una inspiración para nuestra vida, para mí, para Mayra, mi familia y el teatro que hago. She's been an inspiration for our life, for everything. And I'm just happy that I was able to just engage once again. Life is so crazy, but just to take even this moment of breath together, even if we're not in the same like physical space, we're in this same virtual sort of space and we are here breathing and present. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And I'm just uh, continuing to point out a few things that Rosa said. Theater is not in the architecture. Theater happens everywhere. How do we connect with people? How do we engage with folklore as part of theater instead of just folklore? We are, those are the cultures that have made us. Um, I think uh, studying what, what talks to people right now is what will do the theater of the future. That was my last question. What was the theater of the future? But you just answered that perfectly. So I thank you all for the time. I thank you like from my whole heart, Rosa, for this, uh, for this beautiful conversation. And we will see each other around in the Zoom, in the Zoom Zooms. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Really appreciate everybody being here.